Hello guys, uh, today we're going to talk about kinematics of a robot manipulator. The outline of this part of the course is going to be uh, some review, then we're going to talk about robot manipulators, uh, including uh, robot configuration and specifications like number of axes, degrees of freedom, precision, repeatability, and so on. Then we, go, we will go further on uh, kinematics, uh, we're going to talk about some preliminary ideas like the world joint and end effector frames and some uh, uh, transformation matrices, particularly rotation, uh, composite rotation matrix and homogeneous transformation matrix, which includes some, uh, also translation. Um, then we will talk about uh, direct kinematics, including the navid hartenberg representation, which is uh, a convention just in order to, to obtain these kinematics is, is a generally accepted universally uh, method. We are going to see some examples and then we're going to go on uh, for inverse kinematics. References for this uh, part of the course are going to be uh, three books mainly. Uh, the one from uh, Spong and Vidyasagar, Robot Modeling and Control, uh, the one from uh, Craig, Robotics, and uh, another very, um, very important book about robotics and, uh, and vision, and MATLAB mainly, uh, which is a book from uh, Peter Cork. And well, guys, uh, first of all, uh, what is a robot? By general agreement, we know that a robot is a programmable machine which imitates actions of an intelligent creature, uh, usually a human, but uh, that's not only humans. I mean, I remember that we have seen uh, robots uh, behaving like snakes or behaving like another kind of animal. So to qualify as a robot, a machine must be able to, first of all, uh, to have sensing and perception. Uh, this is because we need uh, to get information from its surroundings. Uh, then, uh, of course, it should be, uh, uh, able to carry out different tasks like locomotion or manipulation or do something physical such as move uh, or manipulate objects and we're going to have um, that uh, robot should be also reprogrammable in order for this uh, to, to do different things and finally uh, to function autonomously and or interact with human beings uh, well okay now we're going to talk about manipulators Manipulators are typical of robot arms uh, as an industrial robot, as, as we can see here in the slide. And uh, a manipulator has uh, different parts. First of all, it's going to have a different, uh, it's going to have rigid bodies. And these rigid bodies are known as links. Uh, those are connected by joints. So take a look, we have one link here and we have another link here. Okay. And also, uh, they are connected as joints. For this example, we have revolute joints because it is a rotary joint here, and we have another rotary joint here. Okay, and uh, also they have drives. Uh, they it might they might be uh, electric or hydraulic uh, drives, and also we're gonna have a tool which is uh, typically typically mounted here in the flange or a plate. Um, and this is called the, the end effector, okay? Well, now what about uh, robot configuration? Uh, robot configuration refers on the mechanical structure of the, of the robot. For example, uh, it's possible to have uh, this Cartesian robot and if you can see, we have uh, prismatic joints. Remember that prismatic joints are uh, joints that uh, move only in a, in a, in a translation um, way. And uh, we have uh, uh, the first one here, the robot, uh, th this Cartesian robot moves only in three axes. And this uh, movement is just translational. So we have this first axis here that moves um, up and down here. And we have another uh, axis or another link which uh, moves in this axis and another link which moves like this okay 
So we have uh, three prismatic joints. That's why the Cartesian robot uh, is uh, or has a configuration which is PPP. And uh, if you can see, uh, all points that are reached by the end effector can um, describe uh, something like a, a cube. Okay. Now, um, for cylindrical robots, we have now an RPP configuration, which stands for some revolute joint. I mean, this joint here is moving, is turning around. So we have a rotational or revolute joint. And we have a prismatic joint here. Uh, we're going to have another prismatic joint here. Okay. Both uh, second and third link are moving in a translational way. The third one is a spherical robot, and for a spherical robot, we have two revolute joints and one prismatic joint. The first one is a revolute joint like this, another one, second, is uh, moving like this, rotational, and we have a translational movement here for the third link, so it's a prismatic joint, describing as a, uh, a sphere. Same happens with this cylindrical robot, RPP, which is describing a cylinder. Uh, we can have a fully articulated robot, which has uh, three revolute joints here. The first uh, revolute joint is, is in, this, uh, in this position. Uh, you might think this is a shoulder, if you think about a, a, an arm. And you might think as an elbow here. So um, it, it, it is uh, called the articulated robot because we have three revolute joints. Uh, we have another type here, which is the scatter type. Scatter type is, is a, a very commonly used uh, robot for pick and place task. So if you can see, we have a revolute joint here, but take a look, very important. We are having here some uh, link, which is not straight. We have some angle here, okay? And it's uh, again a rigid body. And well, we have another revolute joint here, okay? And we have a prismatic joint here going up and down here. Um, SCADA stands for Selective Compliance Assembly Robot Arm, and it's uh, uh, again it's a uh, very a uh, very commonly used uh, industrial industrially in uh, in in several in several uh, manufacturing processes. Uh, now, very important, uh, we're going to talk about the hand coordinate here because uh, take a look. Instead of hand, we might think as uh, uh, the end effector. But the end effector also is going to have three axes here. And these three axes are very important because these three axes uh, can uh, give us information about the orientation of the end effector. So we're going to have an approach vector here, which is this one here, A. And we're going to have a normal vector like this. And we're going to have a slide vector like this. Okay. Again, this is very important. And we will talk about this a little bit later. In order to classify uh, manipulators, we might uh, we, we have to think about the motion motion control methods that uh, that are available, uh, and also they are uh, used for different applications. The first one is the point-to-point -point control, is when you have a sequence of discrete points, meaning that you uh, I mean trajectory is not not so important here, okay. Um, if you have a sequence of discrete points, like in spot welding, you're going to have that the robot is going to, for example, uh, putting just a, the end effector in, at some point and then the end effector uh, in another point. Okay, But anyway, trajectory is not very important. Another uh, typical uh, application is a spot welding, uh, a pick and place, or loading on and unloading uh, um, some, uh, some, some object. On the contrary, we have continuous path control. In this uh, kind of motion control, we need to follow a prescribed uh, path. So uh, the motion is controlled path. So we need to do uh, tracking. I mean, trajectory planning first and then a tracking uh, algorithm in order for the end effector to go as, as we want. Um, applications are spray painting, uh, typical, uh, arc welding, for example, and, and gluing. For robot spe specifications, um, 
we can take into account the, num the number of axes, the degrees of freedom, uh, the workspace, the payload, the precision, and the repeatability of the robot. So about the number of axes, we're going to call uh, the major axis, which give us the position of the grist. Major axes are like this. Uh, take a look, we're going to have uh, some uh, uh, first axis here, okay, uh, in such a way that this robot can move rotationally. We have another axis here, okay, and this axis uh, uh, allows uh, this link to go this way okay and we're gonna have another axis here okay and this other axis here uh, allows uh, this link to move up and down in this direction okay so we're gonna have that that these three axes are gonna give us uh, the position of the end effector or position of the grist. I mean this position here. Okay. <clears throat> then those are called major axes, and we're gonna have the minor axes. The minor axes are going to be used to uh, orient the tool. So if you remember hand coordinates, we're gonna have another frame here with. Uh, the approach vector with the slide vector and with the normal vector here okay remember and um, in such a way that we're going to have a typical for an industrial robot we're going to have a typical six degrees of freedom robot but sometimes uh, it's useful to have another link another axis just in order for reaching around some obstacle or uh, in order to avoid undesirable configuration. And um, those robots are called redundant robots, okay? Now, what about degrees of freedom? Degrees of freedom are uh, related to the, to the movements that the robot can do, okay? So um, this is uh, six degrees of freedom. It has six axes, and it is uh, closely related to the quantity of, the, of axes that we have. Another very important idea is the workspace. For the workspace, uh, uh, workspace are, is formed with all the points that the end effector can reach. Okay. So imagine for a rectangular robot or, or an uh, uh, um, Cartesian robot, we're going to have that the workspace is something, something like a cube, okay, like a hollow cube, because there are some positions inside this cube that are, uh, are not uh, uh, able to be reached by the end effector. Um, then the payload, payload is very easy, is the load capacity, I mean, how much weight can the, can the robot lift, for example. And uh, another question is the precision versus repeatability. Um, I mean, sometimes uh, a robot is, is needed to be very precise, uh, and it's, it's not going to be uh, um, uh, used in a, in, a, in a repeated way. Uh, for example, uh, the Da Vinci robot, the, uh, the robot which is operating some person. Um, for this, it's more important the precision than the repeatability. And then, uh, talking about repeatability, there are another applications, typical industrial applications, for which uh, it is very important for the robot to have repeatability. Repe repeatability means that the error is going to be uh, reduced at every, at every movement or every cycle for the robot. This is very important for industrial applications. Now that we know preliminary concepts in robots, um, please go to the link in the slide and uh, put some comments on configuration, uh, motion control method, number of axes, degrees of freedom, workspace and payload, and precision versus repeatability. Uh, the idea is to choose one of the robots in the video and uh, make the, all, the, all the classification for the robot. Okay. So, what is kinematics? Uh, we're going to talk about forward kinematics and inverse kinematics. 
Uh, forward kinematics is the problem of uh, given joint variables uh, obtain the position and orientation of the end effector. Meaning that, uh, take a look, what about the joint variables? We're going to use some vector here, okay, named Q, and we're going to design uh, joint variables for each one of the joints that we have in the robot, okay? Remember that joints could be revolute or prismatic joints. So, for example, um, in a prismatic joint, the joint variable is going to be a distance, right? But for revolute joint, uh, the joint variable is going to be some angle, right? Then uh, what's going to happen here is that you're going to have a set of joint variables here, which are going to be uh, inside this array and this vector, which is Q. So those are the joint variables. Now, what about position and orientation of the end effector? First of all, again, we're going to group all these variables into a vector named capital Y here uh, in such a way that we're going to have the position of the end effector, uh, so X, Y, and Z, and we're going to have the orientation of the end effector, which is also very important. And uh, those variables are going to be O, A, and T. Okay. So problem is to relate these joint variables with the end effector. Okay. This is the problem of forward kinematics. But what about inverse kinematics? Of course, inverse kinematics is the opposite problem. Uh, say, uh, imagine that the end effector position and orientation is given. I mean, we know what is the desired position and orientation of the end effector. So we know this capital Y vector form with position X, Y, Z and orientation O, A, T. And uh, once we know that, the problem is how to arrange, how to change this joint variable in order to reach the desired position of the end effector. So, given Y, problem is to find Q, okay? Then, uh, let's make an example uh, in order to illustrate forward and inverse kinematics. Um, imagine that you have one uh, degree of freedom planar robot uh, whose length is L here and uh, it is uh, or it has uh, a rotational movement here so we have a revolute joint so the joint variable is going to be an angle for this case we have theta here we know the uh, the length which is l and uh, what for forward grammatics problem is to know the coordinates of the end effector so coordinates x0 and y0. So it's a very simple problem because if you remember we have x0 equals to L cosine of theta or and y0 is going to be L sine of theta. So this is a problem of forward kinematics because we know uh, this value theta here which is the joint variable. So knowing the joint variable we know the position of the end effector. Now for inverse kinematics <clears throat> the problem is knowing uh, position of the end effector. In this case, it's possible to use this x0 uh, to know the joint variable. So theta is found easily using inverse cosine of x0 over L. Another way to have this is using uh, coordinate y0 in such a way that theta could be also obtained as inverse sine of y0 over L. Another very important concept here are, uh, is, is the concept of reference frames. So uh, take a look at uh, uh, the object and uh, the robot are in a, typically in, in one room. So uh, the room should have assigned a frame which this, in this case, we are going to call the world frame. So uh, the world frame can uh, or is going to be the reference uh, 
for knowing where is the robot, where uh, are all the joints and uh, joint frames of the robot and where is the, the object, okay? So this is the world frame here. And uh, about the robot, for the robot we're going to assign frames for each one of the joints that we have. So for example, for this robot, we we're gonna have this base frame, okay, X, Y, Z. And uh, then we're going to assign frames to each one of the joints. For example, we're going to have another frame X, Y, Z here in the joint. And we have another uh, frame here in this joint. And finally, we're going to have the tool frame here, which is uh, which uh, uh, give us the orientation of the end effector. Also, uh, it's possible to have frames attached to some obstacles, to some objects, uh, like in this, uh, like in this example. Before going to um, uh, transformation matrices, it's very important to remember what is the dot product. Uh, so uh, in order to define what is the dot product, let X and Y be arbitrary vectors in uh, R3, and uh, theta be the angle from X to Y. Notice that it is not the same, the angle from X to Y, that the angle from Y to X, okay? Uh, another very important consideration is the positive uh, direction of measuring an angle is always counterclockwise. Well, uh, definition of dot product is that x dot y is going to be uh, equal to the magnitude of x times magnitude of y times cosine of theta. Um, then, properties of orthonormal coordinate frame. Uh, please uh, remember that orthonormal coordinate frame means that we have x, y, and z. And actually, uh, from x to y, and from y to z, and from z to x, we have 90 degrees. So it means that they are mutually perpendicular. So for this case, we're going to use unit vectors. Unit vectors as i vector dot uh, j. Uh, vector equals zero. That is because if they are perpendicular, then we're going to have here that cosine of 90 degrees is precisely zero. Uh, also, i dot k equals zero and k dot j equals zero. And those are unit vectors, meaning that the magnitude of i of unit vector i equals one. And same happens for uh, j and k uh, unit vectors. Then uh, let's start with uh, coordinate transformation using uh, the simplest case. Uh, consider some uh, reference coordinate frame here in black axis, uh, axis X, uh, axis Y, and axis Z here. And let us consider another frame attached to somebody maybe. Uh, but let us consider this other frame, which is uh, in red here, with axis U, B, and W, okay? Well, now, problem is how to obtain the position of this point P with respect to reference frame and with respect to the, the UBW frame, okay? So we know that uh, we have a couple of representations of this point P in, in XYZ. One representation is using uh, um, this uh, vector or this vector form. We are using just columns here. That's why we have the transpose here. And uh, we know that we're gonna have coordinates of this point P in XYZ are PX, PY, and PZ. But if we want to represent the position of point P with a vector, then we're going to use a unit vector i, a unit vector j, and unit vector k. And we know that we need to multiply px times ix, and then plus uh, py times jy, and pz times kz. Remember that k, j, and i are unit vectors, and px, py, and pz are scalars, okay? Well, the position of point P, but now with respect to our UBW frame, 
can be obtained in the same way. Let us consider the vector representation here. Then we're going to have uh, PU, IU plus PBJB plus PWKW. Because uh, these two frames uh, coincide, then of course we're going to have that the coordinates values are going to coincide. I mean, PU is going to be equal to PX, PB equals to PY, and PW equals to PC. Now, uh, let us consider the case in which uh, our frame, um, our red frame, um, is rotating around our reference frame. Just rotation means that both origins are going to coincide. And let us consider again point P here. Then uh, we know that position of point P using this vector notation in XYZ coordinates is going to be PX, IX, uh, plus PYJY, -Y plus PZ, KZ, and uh, coordinates of point P in a UBW frame um, in, in a vector form is going to be expressed as PUIU plus PVJB plus PWKW. Take a look that uh, in this case, uh, PX is not going to be equal to PU, PY is not going to be equal to PB, and PZ is not going to be equal to PW. And this is because, of course, vector, unit vectors uh, of frame X, Y, and Z, and unit vectors of uh, frame UBW are not coinciding. So there's a way to relate coordinates of point P in X, Y, Z, and coordinates of point P in UBW. And uh, it happens that this is uh, just a linear transformation here, which is precisely uh, this, uh, this formula here. We are going to assume for now that we're going to have this relationship, OK? Now, take a look. We're going to consider the position of point P in UBW frame using this vector notation, OK? And what we are going to do now is to uh, find projections of this P vector onto X, Y, and Z axis, respectively. So what we are going to find is PX, PY, and PZ. In order to obtain the projections, what we need to do is to use dot product. For example, here, for PX, uh, we're going to project this P vector onto X axis using unit vector X, unit vector I X. So uh, that product is, uh, the result of the dot product is going to be equal to I X dot I U. Uh, remember that we are obtaining the, the dot product with respect to this, uh, or using this, uh, this position. Then I have a PU, remember that it is a scalar. That's why I could change PU uh, at, at, at the final, uh, at the end of this term, plus IX dot JB and this times PB, which again is a scalar, plus IX dot KW, uh, and again PW is a scalar. So we do exactly the same in order to obtain PY we're going to project this vector P onto Y axis. I mean, we need to obtain the dot product of uh, unit vector J uh, with the, the position vector P. And uh, we're gonna have uh, the same here, or the same, uh, the same idea. And finally, in order to find PZ, we project uh, P on Z axis unit vector K. Okay. From the previous slide, uh, we had three equations relating uh, coordinates PX, PY, and PZ of point P in XYZ frame. And um, we can factor this PU, PB, and PW, which, are, which of course are the coordinates of point P in UBW frame. 
and happens that uh, we can have this matrix here, which is a general case for the matrix, and we're going to have only that product inside this matrix. Uh, then take a look again, we are going to have a linear uh, uh, representation here because we have some vector here equals to some matrix. This matrix is the rotation matrix and uh, another vector here. Okay, so we have a linear, a linear representation or a linear transformation here. Um, then, for example, let's take rotation about x axis with theta angle. We have a just rotation, it means that both uh, origins coincide, and rotation is about x axis. So, uh, we're going to have that frame um, UBW is rotating with this angle theta here in such a way that axis U coincides with axis X, but for axis Y and axis B, we're going to have some angle here, theta, which is going to be the same angle from axis Z to axis W. And we have a position of point P here. So the only thing that we need to do is to obtain all these uh, dot products and we're going to find this rotation matrix. Okay, so how to do it? Take a look. If I have AX dot IU, I know that a dot product of uh, X and u is going to be magnitude of vector x times magnitude of vector u times cosine of theta. But for this case, theta equals zero degrees. And we are using unit vectors. So magnitude is one for this, magnitude is one for this other uh, unit vector. And uh, cosine of theta is one. That's why this first term becomes one. Um, let us go with this uh, another uh, product here. Take y and u. So let's find we have y here and u here. And if you can see, we have 90 degrees between them. And cosine of 90 degrees is 0 degrees. I, I'm, I'm sorry, it's 0. And um, the other, this 0, is because z and u are also also perpendicular so we're gonna have take a look we have u here we have z here so they are perpendicular so um, that product is, is zero <clears throat> in the same way we're gonna have that this uh, dot product of x and b equals zero and that product of x and w is going to be again zero okay so using the definition of that product previously defined we have uh, for this obtaining this cosine of theta. Take a look, we're going to have y, uh, y and b. We have y here, we have, we have b here, and theta goes from y to b. And then what is happening here is that this is cosine of theta because of the definition. Uh, as an exercise, try to find sine, uh, uh, minus sine, and cosine. Sorry for the Spanish here. This relationship, um, using this uh, vector here, which is position in uh, x, y, z, a point P, and this other vector, which is the position of point P in UBW frame, we have here the rotation matrix. If we have this relationship, then take a look. It is possible to obtain three equations here. I mean, Px is going to be, remember how to multiply matrices we have to multiply the row times the column. So Px is going to be one times Pu plus zero times Pb plus zero times Pw. So Px equals Pu as expected because both axes coincide. Uh, then in order to find Py, we're gonna have uh, zero times Pu uh, plus cosine of theta times Pb, which is this term, uh, minus uh, sine of theta times Pw here. And the last equation is easily found as Pz equals to Pb 
times sine of theta uh, plus pw times cosine of theta. Using the same idea or the same procedure, I mean using the basic uh, rotation matrix, it is possible to obtain uh, the rotation about y axis uh, with theta uh, and rotation about z axis with theta. Take a look that this R is precisely this uh, uh, matrix ROT depending on z or y and theta. And uh, just look at the differences here. Uh, just for you to remember, if we are rotating around x, then we have a number one in this position. If we are rotating about y, then we have number one in this other position at the center. And if we are rotating uh, around the uh, z, we're going to have number one here. And always, uh, when we have one uh, in, a, in some position, then we are going to have zeros in the rest of the row and zeros in the rest of the, of the column. Such happens for uh, this uh, Y rotation matrix and the same for this other rotation matrix for Z. Okay. Okay. Now, what about cosines? Cosines are only in the main diagonal. Always. Okay. Same happens here in Y. If you can see and also in z okay and what about signs we're gonna have signs in uh, this diagonal if we have cosine cosine here we have sine and minus sine here and uh, take a look for y this sign is not uh, above but below and again the sign is in the diagonal and finally, for Z, we have the sign above and uh, we have the, the signs in the diagonal. Uh, we're going to use this notation. I mean, instead of using the whole world COS for cosine, we're going to have just C for cosines. R, we're going to have S for signs. So notice that uh, what we have found so far is a given position of point P in UBW coordinates, how to obtain position of point P in XYZ coordinates. So this is the rotation matrix. But what if we have position of point P in XYZ coordinates and we need to obtain coordinate uh, position of point P in UVW coordinates. So uh, you might think that it's, uh, of course, it's very easy. The only thing that we uh, should do is to obtain the inverse of rotation matrix R, right? How to obtain the inverse of this rotation matrix? Take a look. A very important idea is that dot products are commutative. So uh, I, uh, for the first term here, ix dot iu, for the inverse matrix is going to be i u dot i x uh, using the same procedure for for the uh, relating these uh, couple of vectors, but that products are commutative. So what we're going to have is that uh, this inverse matrix. Let me name this inverse matrix Q. What we're going to have is that take a look. We're going to have the transpose matrix. I mean the inverse is the transpose matrix in such a way that Q times R, it is exactly the same that R transpose times R or R inverse times R. And this is identity matrix, meaning that this Q is the inverse matrix. Inverse matrix is the transpose matrix. One way to know if some matrix is a rotational matrix, a, rota a, basic, a basic rotation matrix is that uh, its transpose is going to be the inverse matrix. So let's make an example. Consider a point um, A in UBW coordinates defined with coordinates 4, 3, and 2. And this is attached to a rotating frame. And frame rotates uh, 60 degrees about the z axis. 
of the reference frame. So problem is to find coordinates of the point relative to the reference frame after the rotation. So what do we do? First of all, when we have a coordinate uh, given in JBW frame, I mean in the rotating frame, then what we use is the simple formula for R. I mean, A in XYZ is going to be a rotation matrix of take a look Z axis around Z axis and we have 60 degrees and this rotation matrix should be multiplied times the coordinates or, or the position of uh, vector A <clears throat> in UBW frame so it's very easy to find and uh, we're gonna have that rotation this rotation matrix is easily found as remember um, a rotation matrix from Z um, is given by this expression here then we multiply times uh, a in ubw frame and finally we have the result let us now consider the problem uh, in which we have the coordinates but in xyz frame and um, i mean we have the coordinates with respect to the reference uh, coordinate system. What we want to do now is to find the corresponding point A in UBW, but with respect to the rotated UBW coordinate system. And let us consider 60 degrees about the axis. So what we have here is take a look. We are using now the transpose of the rotation matrix here. And transpose is because uh, now what is given is coordinates in XYZ frame, I mean in the reference frame, okay? So we use the transpose and uh, it's easily uh, found uh, the, the, the answer. We can use uh, MATLAB in order to find these rotation matrices. And uh, we're going to use the, the toolbox, the robotics toolbox from Peter Cork and you can as you know it's possible to download this robotics toolbox from the peter cork um, web page and you can use these instructions here um, you just um, store rot x which is a basic rotation matrix around x of pi over 2 which is 90 degrees and then uh, we might use this other instruction, TR plot, which is the, the, the plot of the rotating uh, uh, frame, and uh, it's possible to animate. So try, uh, try to do this uh, using MATLAB. A very important thing to consider is the interpretation of uh, these rotation matrices. Uh, so take a look, generally, Columns of uh, any rotation matrix contains directions of new coordinate axis in terms of the actual coordinate axis. So, for example, take this rotation matrix. Uh, we're going to have the first column, 1, 0, 0. And this means that x axis is over the old x, uh, x direction. Second column, we have the one at the last uh, row. It means that the y-axis, because it is the second column, the y-axis is going to be over the old z-direction because of the position of the number one here is of z. And uh, the last column, which is the z-axis, this z-axis is going to be over the negative old y-direction. This is because we have this minus one in, in, in this position. 